Okay, now we are recording. You can start shitposting. Three people with differently abrasive personalities <laughs> talking over each other. I'm lovely, what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean well, abrasive? Insignificant. We're going to be over important today. Listen up. Uh, inform us if you actually watch the visuals, or if this is something you put on, say, while stalking prey, <laughs> knife in one hand, uh, I don't know what would be in the other one, some kind of tracking device. Genitalia. Maybe a water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, water bottle. Stay hydrated. <laughs> when hunting man or beast, make sure you keep your fluids up. The most dangerous game is actually dehydration. Well, yes. <laughs> The only winning move is not to play. Wow, really mixing my, my metaphors there. Yeah. We're doing an intro? Do we still do intros? I, I don't bother with intros for the bonus episodes. Oh, okay. Do you want to come up with one on the fly? I can come up with one. Go on. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Statistically Insignificant. This is bonus episode 19. I'm... And with me is Tess. Hello and welcome to insignif- Statistically Insignificant. <laughs> I am uh, one no, of the hosts. Hello. Hi. No, I'm still doing the intro. <laughs> Tess, you've just been introduced. introduced. You're peaking on the audio. This is going to take... <laughs> <laughs> could, you, could you scream in a more moderate fashion? <laughs> Much better. Thank you. Also with me <laughs> is Bart. Bart... <laughs> <laughs> no, I will not apologise for my crimes in the 1990s <laughs> Yugoslav War. They were entirely justified. All right, well... well could you get him down for these? I just wanted you to know um, that we're aware, we see you. We hear you. Eyes on bar. <laughs> <laughs> Today we are talking about artificial intelligence, and I'm going to put air quotes around this one, because we're going to be talking about how actually what we have is neither of those things. Absolutely. Actually, my intro was uh, more apropos than even I knew. <laughs> Why, a demonstration seen... of organic stupidity. Have you seen uh, when people try to AI that generate YouTube thing. videos? Right, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, remind me a bit later. Sure. But, uh, the, you still the... haven't laughed at my organic stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> the When you try and get YouTube to generate a video, sometimes the dialogue will just become like pained screaming. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, wait. When you say generate, you mean as in some sort of like generative AI, quote unquote. Yeah, like like a Markov chain or whatever the yeah, equivalent yeah, yeah. is for video and audio and whatnot. Lamar, <laughs> that's pretty good. Where yeah, they just top one and I and it just starts screaming because that's valid human voice as far as it's concerned. That's probably good on the YouTube algorithm, right? Like it, it's kind of like expressive. And like... <laughs> I've watched that video three times, but not because they were trying to generate an ad for like a hotel chain or something. <laughs> But well, because also, the one with the funny screaming uh, uh, Look, I am willing to believe that that is the one instance of an actual true artificial intelligence, and it is screaming in horror at what we have asked to do it. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. I scream in horror when I'm forced to produce advertising, so it's what, true. Are, what are we to do? Yep. We'll be talking about, quote unquote, artificial intelligence. I'm going to refer to it mostly as machine learning, and we'll talk about why in a second. We'll talk about what it's used for, what it is and isn't some of the underlying mechanisms for how they are built, and also the worst cunts you know and why they are obsessed with it. Yeah, m- suppose my first question is, comparison there of the first line to the second, to me as a complete layman, mm-hmm. I understand AI to be dumb because I have eyes and ears. Yes. But how does how does statistics come into this? Fundamentally, these are statistical models. Right, because they're predicting what is the next yeah, yeah, word yeah. that should come here. Pretty much, yeah. So first, terminology. We see a lot of material talking about quote-unquote AI or artificial intelligence. Yeah. So this is one of those technical terms that has slipped the bounds of its original academic use. So artificial intelligence is a field in computer science. It encompasses things that we have and things that we don't. So here is kind of like big data stuff. Outside of that is what we might call machine learning, which I'm going to write as ML. And these are kind of subsets of the field known as artificial intelligence within computer science. They are not actually intelligent, as we will get to. But the number of credulous articles I see talking about the AI revolution these things, it raises my blood pressure because we need to interrogate this terminology more than we are. The term AI comes with particular assumptions about what can and cannot be done. And also how criticizable, I guess, a system is. 
and how accessible the underlying structures are. I'll try to stick to the word machine learning when I talk about this stuff, but I will slip up just because this is the word term that dominates the, the discourse at the moment. Just to speak to that sort of the credulity of the media, this is, I mean, it's incredibly frustrating with AI, again, even as a complete layman, but it just seems to be par for the course for whatever the present hype cycle is, whether it was NFTs, the blockchain, yes. cryptocurrency, the media, I don't want to get too Chomsky-esque, but these things serve a purpose in the in the framework of the world we live in. Yeah. The media that we see yeah. is going to select for articles which are supportive of what people think this will do for existing power structures. I do think that there is like a common thing in the public where when a new technology comes about, you kind of like buy it or whatever. And this was kind of like useful 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when you'd like buy an iPhone and it was better than your old flip phone. Or yeah, yeah. you'd get Google Chrome, even though it was like mm. obviously like terrible like privacy and shit on it server but like it would be like more useful than internet explorer or whatever but like as we go on the audience is still there to like go for that like new technology thing but everything just gets worse and worse and more shit and doesn't work i think that the tech optimist discourse has not left yeah the um horrible reality of technology is you know fast encroaching on our lives and i will remind everyone that the luddites were right uh, we should <laughs> in fact destroy these things and instead impose a a communal more human-centered rather than technology-centered society oh you want the um the brains in jars that do all the thinking for us i get that <laughs> stasis bone totem biotech <laughs> look there are some people whose brains i believe should be in jars <laughs> like that. one of the sources of the internet most of it's like u.s military shit but like one of them is like in aliandes chile the cybersyn project which was like a way of like yeah yeah doing instantaneous transfer of information from like factory floors to the like centralized production and stuff like that there are ways that you can use these technologies usefully i mean we have discussed in the past the fact that the computer revolution opens up ways to do central planning that was simply not possible prior to that yeah and that if if we had a society which actually said, hey, there is a minimum amount of stuff that needs to be done for people to have a minimum standard of living. We could definitely use what we would call big data or machine learning algorithms to help us do that. We already do. I mean, famously, huge corporations are already planned economies. Yeah, yeah, respect. absolutely. But as going back to what I was saying about the media, it turns out that uh, present class relations tend to reproduce themselves. And I know that that's wankingly trite, trite but <laughs> I do think it's worth keeping in mind that AI thrives in the economy by pretending to be more mystic and oh, yeah. complicated than it is. And it's so, a magic black box. It isn't. Right. But these, these trite observations that I'm making, I think, are useful to the extent that they ground us that, no, these aren't. this isn't some new phenomenon. What we are seeing here is old stories playing out with new toys. Yeah. And in fact, not even that new. So first I want to talk about the types of machine learning algorithm. I would say like a decade ago, I got really interested in YouTube videos of people saying, I programmed this machine learning thing to beat Jump King. <laughs> and it learned to do it in 16 hours. I'm like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And now apparently that's every email I get. Is the, <laughs> is the robot that plays Jump King. And all of the ones you send. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> There are kind of two broad branches of machine learning algorithms. Uh, we're going to talk about the ones that do identification and classification, and also the ones that generate stuff. So these are deeply related. Often if you have something that's generating stuff, you'll have an identification or classification algorithm in the background, and then you will ask it to produce new stuff on the basis of what's in that. So we're going to talk about the identification and classification first. I know that Mystery Science 3000 rules, you shouldn't refer to better movies in a shit movie. And as a podcast of dubious quality, we probably shouldn't keep sending people <laughs> to better ones. But I really would um, go to Trash Future here when they point out that at the end of the day, this is a exploited worker in the global south. We will get to that, don't worry. Gianna, because identification and classification, at the end of the day, a human has to say, mark all these tiles that contain a bicycle. And I will point out, what I'm saying here is not entirely new. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit more into depth on the kind of underlying technical structure than a lot of things, but tech won't save us, trash future. There are a lot of podcasts and other media and people doing really, really good reporting and writing books and things about the fact that these are not magical things that are going to save the world and that we should 
in fact, limit their use and limit their ability to affect lives and make decisions about lives. Well, it's also when, like, um, Google Translate came in, that just, like, inimitated... It just destroyed like... translation? Yeah. yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, we will talk about that one as a specific example as well. The general situation why you would build a machine learning algorithm to do this for you is that you have a huge data set and that you need some way to dig through it without human... Inter- well, with, without having to have a person look at every single one. And by big, huge data set, I don't just mean situations where you can't just pay a handful of grad students to do it for you, for example. I mean situations where you have literally so much data that it would take a hundred human lifetimes to go through it individually. Big old warehouse. Yeah, or the output of one of our various orbiting satellites, for example. These are genuine use cases for this sort of thing. Uh, Unfortunately, they are not the only places that they get used. So what you typically do here is that you have a decision-making system System. just occurred to me that you know we used to take those orbital photographs and have wonderful heartwarming stories some parts of armies of volunteers who would scan the star scan the sky and classify things and now these days um it's a whole bunch of depressed people locked in a room somewhere so for the astronomy examples they are typically still volunteer driven oh okay that's a market but listen to me we have a disruption opportunity <laughs> <laughs> i have some bad news for you that amazon mechanical turk has already tried damn yeah the sorts of decisions that you might want to be making are identifying interstellar objects. I'm sorry, it never like ceases to me amaze me that they call it Mechanical Turk when like that's literally what it is. There's like literally a guy yes, there. It's so <laughs> mask off. Oh my god. Folks, they're dabbing on us. We mm-hmm. are being teased. We are being uh, tormented. Oh, you listen to Chapo too. <laughs> in general, in science there are use cases for this. There's also um IDing plants, birds, etc. And generally, the stuff that's used for IDing in ecology, it's not treated as the final word. I mean, ecologists will use it, but that's generally to get to a genus level identification that they will then refine that information to the actual species. For kind of casual observers or um, the layperson, it can be interesting, but they shouldn't treat it as like an absolute identification. So anytime something has like IDing plants and fungi and things, it will come with a big disclaimer that basically says, do not trust these and do not eat anything. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Because some, <laughs> somebody, <laughs> the nightmare situation is somebody using like um, iNaturalist or something to identify a mushroom, eats it and dies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I watched a YouTube video of a guy who um, for decades has done like wild foraging in countryside Britain. Yeah. And he took out one of the apps. He's like, damn, you'd be dead in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one, which is a bit more tenuous for similar reasons is medical diagnosis Ooh, that seems bad it's a hard one because fundamentally these are things where if you have a a lot of slides of cell cultures and things and you're looking for uh, to identify um like cancer cells there is an argument to be made that if you have both a well-built well-structured machine learning algorithm and a pathologist You could take the more conservative of those two, right? So Mm -hmm. the pathologist can look at things and say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. The algorithm looks at them and says, yes, no, yes, no, yes, yes. If anyone is a a yes on one but a no on the other, you can check those. Yeah, okay. This is not necessarily how they are implemented now. And certainly I think that there's a long way to go on this, but I don't think it's the worst idea in the world. The problem is, of course, that you cannot do this in our current model of healthcare without the machine learning algorithm simply replacing the doctor, and that is bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You couldn't have it as an additional cost when yeah. you could just get rid of them. What's I mean, I remember in school people were talking about quote unquote expert systems, which was like a um what was the name of that genie you could like go online and uh, he'd guess what you were talking about? What, like a pop culture item or icon? I have no 20 idea. 20 questions. Oh, yeah, fucking I remember that. Basically, it was a it was a website and he would ask you yes, no question. And he would narrow down onto what you were talking about. It was pretty good. He could always guess um, the Primarchs from the 40K universe <laughs> if I was doing that. And I think expert systems, the idea was that you would do that to find out if the ache in your tummy was uh, indigestion or like appendicitis. Right, so it's basically going through a, what we might call a decision tree of questions. Precisely, yeah. These were these things as expert systems. And there was a lot of people talking about them, I remember, in school, which was, oh, f- oh my God, like 2005, 2006. Mm-hmm. Um, and we won't mention how long ago that was. <laughs> right, and I'm re- I am reminded now about AI, about people talking in a similar light, that soon these things will be helping doctors all around the world. It turns out expert systems just 
fizzled and never really took off. Because, because they're not wants, as good as an actual expert. Yeah, nobody wants the fucking website genie telling them whether or not they have, like, exploding ass disease or whatever. It doesn't seem that much different from, like, Googling your symptoms. and then, It is like, not. <laughs> I mean, the only, the only thing that something like that can do that Googling your symptoms can't is have a well-informed set of questions to ask. Yeah, and that's why it was called an expert, because I have done tech support. There is a script you can follow for 90% of things sure. to diagnose, especially if it's something common. The problem is you don't want that temperature percent error rate when it's you know your, your body yeah yeah so so one of the reasons that medical diagnosis systems are kind of bad on the whole from this algorithm perspective is because it is not only somebody's account of their own systems that goes into making a medical diagnosis and often people really struggle to describe their systems in a way that is medically useful particularly under stress and when they don't quite understand the questions they're being asked and so on there's an awful lot of how somebody presents as a person in a clinical room that goes into interpreting what they are saying these algorithms cannot get access to that yeah yeah I mean, like, that has its own disadvantages as well, like, right? Oh, yes, like, absolutely. The the human biases that go into this yeah, are yeah, certainly absolutely. a problem. And, I mean, I am somebody who got told that what turned out to be a bunch of spinal damage and arthritis was just a little bit of back pain, Oof. and I couldn't really complain about it. You know, I, ha- I have a stake in this as well. Yeah, as absolutely. Well. <laughs> Telling my computer my deepest, darkest fears as a woman having it sent me to a sex shop to buy a dildo or something. <laughs> You have hysteria. You need to be released. <laughs> Dean, if you're telling a computer your deepest, darkest fears as a woman, then, I mean, we have a cure for that. It's called estrogen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, other things and that are equally bad are, like, hiring in scholarships. Oh, that's so fucked up. <laughs> yep. Nice. <laughs> this is something that comes up when you have a thousand people applying for a job. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I can't imagine the sort of circumstances that would lead to that happening. Also, visas. And I'm sure there's no bias about somebody's um, heritage or no, skin not at tone all. that would never crop I mean up after all if you you simply train it on the people who have got these scholarships before and as we know that is objective data and not at all enforcing the existing bias. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> Broadly speaking, where these decision systems go wrong is when they are applied to people. I think that this is a pretty good rule for ethics around using these algorithms. Don't fucking apply them to make decisions about people. Yeah. There is no situation in which that, I think, is better on the whole than a human empathy-based system. Of course, if you have bias in your human system, well, I mean, that's going to get reflected in the AI anyway, and it's going to be far harder to challenge because somebody will go, oh, computer says no, which is the only good joke as far as I understand from the office. <laughs> no, that's from uh, Little Britain. Oh, I see. Scholarship should not exist because, like, all this shit should be free anyway. <laughs> yes, but... Oh, I- I'm, with, I'm with you. It just it just occurred to me that there is a line that Jordan Peterson really pioneered in sort of modern, like, what? culture war shit. Yeah. Which is that, you know, don't mess with shit you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, he uses his, it to his... say, like, like, don't attempt to address societal ills because maybe those societal ills came from came out of forces and systems that had good reason to do that, etc. Yes, he's and absolutely he... using it to say, oh, struct- actually, hierarchies are good. Yeah, precisely. But it just occurred to me that... As much as I'm on the left, Zizek makes exactly the same argument. It's very embarrassing for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying that in terms of AI, this is the one environment where I fucking agree. Just don't presume that a computer is going to handle a human being as a model. It's just the dragon of chaos is unleashed in this. I'm, I'm with Jordan on his stupid bullshit insofar as it applies to AIs. Don't go fucking around with this stuff. <laughs> the computer's not smart enough. See, I'm not with him on most things except like taking a bunch of benzos and eating like some cool meats. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> so image recognition is another big thing. Critical it's... support for Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Let me put it this way. I hope there is a swift resolution to his health issues. <laughs> so Thank image you. recognition is another one of those big things which is kind of lesser decision sort of environment and more like an identification thing. This is stuff like in astronomy, we've already mentioned and arguably I should have put that under this section, in ecology, but also self-driving cars, auto moderation, and even identity checks. There are better and worse uses and better and worse implementations in this. For example, using an algorithm to detect child sex abuse material 
means that you don't necessarily have to expose people to as much child sex abuse material. Yeah, as I understand it, being a moderator for that kind of stuff just kills you. It does, yes. As as, as it would, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. poison for the And song. I'm glad no one but who's I, doing that work is in any way compensated for in it. In any way, underpaid, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, this is, this is kind of the fundamental conflict, right? Because to develop the reasonable child sexual abuse material filter, you have to have people train it. Yeah. Yes. And we will get to that on the whole, but, like, auto-moderation is an argument for this, but once again, it runs into the fact that false positives for child sexual abuse material are something that you can let, you know, somebody who is well supported in the crime department deal with as opposed to your community moderators. But the production of these is not a faultless exercise, I suppose. Yeah, you. I'm not even going to make jokes about it. It's... Yeah, it, it's just, a, it's a hard problem. And because, you know, some amount of humanity are just awful people, it has to be dealt with. Yeah, it's grim. So the self-driving cars is interesting because where you see like those capture things, so they get you to identify like stairs and rail crossings and everything else, those are producing image databases for self-driving cars to use them to identify objects in their environment. Okay, yeah. So they never ask me to identify ambulance driver or small child crossing street. Is that why they keep running into those? I don't know, but I mean, the alternative is you start sneaking information there that identifies billionaires. <laughs> I know it's like a thing of like capture is that it's often used to like train particular algorithms on. In the old days, it was like old manuscripts, what words they were saying or whatever. And then now yeah. it is more like the self-driving cars kind of thing where like you have to identify traffic lights or whatever. But like, I really don't understand how they have a right and wrong system if the thing you're inputting is to train the algorithm to like understand what's happening. Okay, so um, I can give you a brief description of that. The way they have like... Like, let's say it's a street scene. I'm just going to whip this up really quick. Yeah. You've got some trees and a pedestrian crossing here, right? And then you've got this uh, grid superimposed yeah. on it. Right, and that doesn't look like the, um, the Terminator view at all. <laughs> sure. When it's asking you to identify the grid cells with things in them, right? And let's say for this one, go away. You tag the trees, so you go... Yeah. This is literally Terminator vision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you got those two. It gives that particular image with that particular grid, co grid configuration to, let's say, 10,000 yeah. people. And then it takes the regions of, I think, maximal agreement above some threshold. So, for example, some subset of your, your people may not tag this square. Yeah. But chances are those other four squares would be tagged by basically everyone, right? So then you have... Yeah, right. Yeah, so you have this a kind of um, population agreement model, yeah. and you set a threshold for that. Yeah, okay. Is there, a, just picking the brains of everyone, is there an ethical model for, say, this model in terms of how it works is pretty unobtrusive. Like, you need to prove that you're a human for a bot, and then by doing this, it's a task that takes a few seconds, and you get access to something. Mm -hmm. My problem with all the stuff that's, att that's attached to it, is there an ethical model where, like, you could have state-generated stuff where they got you to do this to, I don't know, will prove you weren't a bot logging into, like, a government website or something? Because it, I could see a use for having this data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem is just that you're being extorted to do this work to access, I don't know, fucking Amazon. Or and whatever. honestly, like, I, I do think it was more ethical when they were trying to, like, work out particular things in old manuscripts that maybe particular academics, even if they spent their entire lives on it, would not get to kind of thing. Like, I do think that was, like, a, yeah, yeah. a good use of that technology. Like, I think that there is a discussion you could have about what a use case would look like, but that discussion hasn't happened is, the, is part of the problem, yeah. right? So this is yeah. fundamentally anti-democratic because it has been imposed on us. Yeah, it would be extorted into doing and, this work. And in particular, the reason that this is necessary is because we have created systems where it is beneficial to have somebody with an algorithm that can get into a lot of different places and spam a lot of different things. Yes. Yeah. A lot of these are actually used to um, block hacker algorithms, which sounds way cooler than it actually is, <laughs> which is basically people trying combinations of passwords and login details from some database that they've used on the web in rapid succession. Yeah. This serves as a block to that nice. yeah. more than it does to somebody actually signing up and creating a fake. Right, but people creating fake logins, speaking of somebody who works in yeah. databases, and that is not a problem. The problem is, yeah. where the fuck did these 2,000 people come from? I pay by the volume of people in this database. Yeah, absolutely. That's very annoying to me. Yes. Like I mean, you said, it could be a use case, but just the present one is bullshit. Well, for example, the process in Australia for getting your ID verified to get a home loan or apply to rent a place and that things like that 
there are basically two big private companies that do it. Yeah. Oof, that gross. should be a fucking government organ. Absolutely. That should just be something that the government does. Yeah, so, look, the- surprise, surprise, we're not a fan of privatisation <laughs> and the intersection of... Well, not just that. Like, if you don't... If you have, like, a proof-of-age card, yep. neither of these companies accept that as a valid form of ID. Even though it's government issue. Even though it's government issue. That's so, so grim. You can ha- Incredible. You- it's so grim. So you basically have to have a driver's licence or a passport or something like that in order for these private companies to recognise your, your ID. Ugh, that sucks. That sucks so bad. It sucks. And this is something that fucking governments should just do. But of course, that would mean the government had to do something. So the other t- sort of AI is what we might call generative algorithms. And what do they generate? Whatever they are trained to do. So these are your chat GPTs, your mid-journey sort of things, or whatever it is that they're using are to fake voices. Yeah, the thing that makes the ad- advert scream. I mean, the fake voices are pretty funny. Oh, they're so I don't like fucking any good, of the other dude. Ones, but... I'm sorry, but it is genuinely very funny to have <laughs> Joe Biden read the whole Volparion breedable Pokemon thing. Yeah, yeah no. Uh, <laughs> this is the only good use of them, let me be clear. Yeah, absolutely. Making stupid stuff has always been great to do with AI. The problem yeah, is, yeah. is that, as we're going to discuss, the worst That never happens in isolation. Yeah. So what we have here is that you have an underlying data set. Dare I say that the profit motive might... <laughs> <laughs> ruin everyone's fun. No, really? And it basically says, uh, what is the most likely output based on the prompt? The very simplest of these is what we would call a Markov chain chatbot. Yeah. Didn't they have one of these in like the 60s? You, are you thinking of Eliza? Yeah, I think so. We'll talk about Eliza, do I? Please tell me it wasn't somebody stuffed in a box. Eliza was <laughs> not. Um, oh, thank God. Yeah, so a Markov chain chatbot basically takes a database. You can train this on your friend's Discord, by the way, and uh, literally outputs the most likely message of a certain length. Every six hours, it posts mm-hmm. the word come. Yes. And nothing in between. And nothing else. Yep, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So, um, or in my case, like, just pretends to be, like, various, like, nationalists of. <laughs> <laughs> Across, across like, different yeah. weird yeah, yeah. countries, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> across the world, yeah, yeah. So Eliza was kind of one of these, but not really. So Eliza, for those who don't know, was a algorithm meant to ask questions like a therapist would, built in, I think, the 60s or 70s or something. And the, the guy who built Eliza was kind of just fucking around and seeing what happened and wound up being quite radicalized against these sorts of algorithms by how he saw people interact with it. So I'm going to link in the description below a couple of articles talking about how um, he was one of the very early people to po- post this stuff, but also he had some- Man, men have one bad experience with women and say they shouldn't exist. <laughs> But all Eliza did was it basically picked a few key words from somebody's statement and asked them a question incorporating those phrases. So if you said, for example, I don't know, um, I, I am stressed at work because my boss is bullying me, Eliza might come back with, tell me more about how your boss is bullying you. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not actually intelligent. It's not actually really being a conversational interlocutor. Okay, well, let's not be mean. Some of us produce a similar level of conversation. (laughs) Well, no joke. It was trained to ask questions in a way that therapists do, right? To try and get inside somebody's way of thinking, help them unpack it. It wasn't just somebody doing bullshit for bullshit's sake, right? It was trained with an intent and a purpose. Yeah. The problem was that people using this immediately started to humanize the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Like they- They They called it Eliza. Well, I mean, that was one side of it, but not just that. (laughs) I mean, people using it started to feel like they had developed a kind of interpersonal connection with this algorithm, which is part of what really freaked out the guy who built it because he's like no and also oh my god please don't think that about the machine i mean like that's a human thing though right it's, it's oh, the same way we, we love to humanize we stuff. see like yeah. faces in the moons and stuff like in the moon we've only got one i believe <laughs> i don't think it is on the whole a bad instinct right i think yeah. the same thing has us put googly eyes on robot vacuum cleaners and love our pets yeah but it is very easy to leverage that to the disadvantage of vulnerable people. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the key things that he was really concerned about. In the same way that social interaction is good, but social media is the devil. Social media is the highest form of evil. And it's just plucking those same strings that, you know, make the good in human life, like meeting your grandmother for lunch. 
Yes. <laughs> Whereas now it's meeting your grandmother to discuss how she saw a video about no-go zones in <laughs> yeah. in West Australia. What are you going to do? I uh, I don't believe this listener. Please follow me at Snitchin' Orwell on either <laughs> Twitter or Blue Sky. And also like Snitchin' Orwell on Letterboxd. Like I'm really having fun on Letterboxd. I've seen 83 <laughs> movies since I started it in January. So like come over there. It's bang a movie September. So I am not convinced that generative AI has many use cases. I mean, the, the fucking around for fun is kind of the best of them, I think. I think it's also practiced for somebody to use it to write their CV or a cover letter because fuck HR departments and fuck the hiring process that people are forced to go through now. Yeah. yeah. But I would rather get rid of the underlying structure that requires that use and then not need them. I'm very anti chat GPT, but my partner is kind of like more pro it just because he can input some stuff and get like a properly worded thing out of it. The fundamental kind of dehumanization and alienation that a lot of people experience in workplaces, I think, lends itself to workers using this to kind of claw some of their own agency back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so as as a way of getting you past a blank page problem, as I think it's referred to, yeah. it's not the worst thing in the world. Like, I know people in science who will use it to basically write a an introductory paragraph to something that they can then heavily edit because they're just kind of paralyzed by having yeah. to come up with a way to explain what they're doing. And the same way that artists can use it to generate a prompt. Yeah. I think there are legitimate uses for all of this. And I, I even think, a little, I know that AI AI art is um, sort of a contradiction of terms, but I think there are uses in art for AI. It's just, again, the context in which this technology has emerged is... It is an exploitative one in which the people whose art is used for it are are not benefiting. The algorithm itself is not creative. All it is doing is returning the most likely thing based on your prompt. I think there is creative reasoning that goes into getting an interesting prompt and getting the algorithm to give you something that you want. I think there's definitely creative reasoning that goes into that, but that doesn't mean that you made the thing. I think, like, the number one problem with it, like, in terms of the arts is, like... Oh, it's all stolen. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, and, like, all these people are the fucking libertarians who fucking give a shit about intellectual property and then suddenly when, yeah. like, you don't have to care about anyone's intellectual property because you can make money off it, it is like... My favourite was a guy who said, to an artist who said, this image is literally just a palette swap of mine. Yeah. yeah. And some libertarian fuck comes back and says, you're just mad that we are proletarianizing art. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Which I can say, what class do you think artists are in? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you fucking idiot. Yeah. I think a lot of artists are using them to... Kind of prototype ideas which is an interesting use of it but to to use that to prototype ideas is like stock images and things where you pack a whole bunch of things together and use that as kind of a, a skeleton that you then develop on that is very very different to typing a prompt in and then posting it to somebody and going hey look i made this or saying this prompt produces these kind of images uh, pay me money and I'll tell you what it was. Which I is think extra bleak. I can't even fuck with it in in terms of that. Honestly, like I don't. Think, yeah, yeah. I don't think that artists should be using this shit. I think that you like have to. I think artists using it is a reasonable response to the the material conditions of their labor. Sure, absolutely. Well, I also think that some of the things that stuff is cool when the AI produces something that looks like a human room, but none of the items or figures or shapes are recognizable. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting to see the surreal the algorithm dreaming of electric rooms if you will. <laughs> yeah i don't have and i don't have the structural critique to sort of understand everything related to that but i do know that ai can produce those kind of images and those kind of images are cool they're interesting as a representation of what the ai f- understand right but i think those things they have aesthetic value because they're just fucking weird okay yeah. i can i can square the circle here nothing that is produced by ai should be able to be copyrighted Mm. yeah yeah yeah. no agree that is kind of the most important thing and i think that like yeah yeah i think if governments pass laws to that extent it would tamp down a lot of the ai speculation and also it would like people would still use it but use it in a kind of like actually artistically interesting way yeah 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 yeah. no i like that that's um that's a nice compromise Mm. i guess then you have to ask how far removed from the generation from an algorithm does something have to be before it can be copyrighted? And I think that's kind of a, a, a much bigger question, because if you get a AI to generate a, a, a room, let's say, and then you use that room and you draw over it and make, as, as a tracing 
background and you draw over it and you make the furniture real is what you have produced subject to copyright. I don't care about it on that tiny level. I yeah, care okay. about it. Did you replace a writer's room? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Did you generate huge portions of a um, of a major production to... Yeah, absolutely. That's where I care. If somebody... The difference between a weird room that's been traced over, whether or not you sell that on your Patreon, I, don't, I just don't give a fuck. It's below the point of... Yeah, but I, I think yeah. that this comes into something that we'll get into a bit more later. What generative algorithms produce, which then gets edited by the people who would have originally produced it, that is the level at which I think that gets blurry, and I think it's a problem. Look, I, I believe that even without AI, the, the present state of art of art say? is... is yeah. dire. <laughs> Is dire and toxic and self-destructive. I don't think AI is necessary. AI is a symptom, not a cause. Necessarily. Yeah, yeah. So to me, as long as they have to employ the same amount of people to wrangle the AI as they would have fired, then that's fine. Because the AI will be garbage. They, then they might as well just keep the writers writing. So but I don't know. As, I, am, as, as, I completely uh, disagree with that. Just because, like, yeah, I don't agree. Because the the material conditions of the labor change, and if they're not paid as much, and the, it's shit of work. My point is not that those things don't happen. My yeah. point is that I think that those degradations of conditions and quality would happen in the vacuum of AI. The change where you are forcing somebody to have some transformative quality on the art, at least yeah. prevent... It's a minimum. I would the... say it's not sufficient. Yeah, yeah. Okay, nothing sufficient. So, yeah, sorry okay. to be gloomy. I do occasionally think <laughs> things, things are sufficient. But in this case, the state of art is insufficient for the production of art. Yeah. See, Phil. Yes. Sorry to be snobby. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm happy I don't to be... think anybody who works at it would disagree with that. I am on a fucking jihad against fucking Disney. But at the same time, I don't know. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> I think in the last two or three years, we've got some fucking excellent movies. Like, there are people still who can get who can cobble together a budget and make something great. I do not share that, like, pessimistic kind of thing. I just think we get more concept contents and most of the content is shit. I would like the realm of interesting, engaging, worthwhile art, and I know that is subjective, but, you know, I think we have a general agreement, to not be exclusively exceptions and outsiders. Yeah. It would be nice if, if the forces involved were turned towards the production of something, I don't know, with, with, with some kind of human resonance. So this has been a, an interesting topic of conversation around the strikes in Hollywood, the Actors and the Writers Guild. Which I but, support, of course. Oh yeah, but in particular around the fact that these media companies are now companies first, and you no longer have the coked up director who just loves movies and wants to make them. You now have people at the top of these, and I mean, those coked up directors, sorry, not coked, coked up company directors, I should say, coked up executives. No, no, producers is, what you, is the word you're thinking Produce, of. Producers, yeah, yeah. yeah. They were not good people, but they at least wanted to make movies in a way that the, the executives now do not. The vibe I get from the people on strike and the vibe I get from that industry is that that has been quite a radical change in the... It's not even vibe, but they're straight up explicitly, they point out that the move from having people who are producers as their career to having investors who are bought up... Yeah. Movie studios is, of course, that's different. You lose all that that institutional. I'm also. Support. I just realised we're we're nearly an hour in, so I'm going to wrangle us to the next bit. <laughs> okay. ah! I got the whip out. It's time to talk about the underlying structures. Because mm. I know functionally, sort of the output and the general idea. You give your whole computer a whole bunch of shit, and it chews it up, and it spits out something slightly, so you know, sloppy. <laughs> Sure, let's go. With I that. don't know shit. I'm sticking to my uh, player piano <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> so these algorithms are ways of mass processing data to find associations. Oh, so you give a computer acid and get it to draw connections? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. This may be between qualitative variables, so like classification systems, identification systems. It may be between quantitative variables, measurements of some kind, or both. But the underlying structure is always the same. They are, these algorithms look for associations. They give different associations, different levels of importance, and you can have different types of association that they can identify. So that, this is why they say, hey, fingers go next to fingers. I'll put a finger next to this finger. Next yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. The big um, pink anime circle has a big red anime nipple in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> this... The AI has learned this. I'll tell you yeah. what, um, I am a fucking tragic weeb. And we know. Um, one of the things is that if a female character is nude, they can have their tits out, but they can't have a nipple on it. It's like censorship in Japanese TV. <laughs> so they just like draw them as like nice, nice. tits without nipples. It's very funny. Uh, this is um, breast cancer survivor <laughs> Absolutely, uh, <yeah. laughs> visibility. Thank you. So the sorts of associations that we can have between qualitative variables are what we would call a positive Association, which means 
Oh, sorry, positive value. No, I follow, I follow. Yeah, yeah. Just Which means helpful. that as one thing occurs, another thing is more likely to occur. A negative association, so uh, two things, sorry, positive is two things occur together. And a negative association, the presence of one thing precludes the presence of another. So you have um, a precluded occurrence. Right, so the presence of hair, you probably wouldn't put like a foot. Well, unless you're a hobbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. The presence of head hair, unless it is a movie. <laughs> by um, uh, director Peter Jackson. Is that what you're going for? I have no fucking idea. I'm so upset. Inglorious Bastards, Pulp Fiction. Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino. In that case, head, head hair next to feet is extremely likely. Can you cut out the awkward pause where I forgot his name? Because it's, re- it's actually a pretty good joke. So no, if you can do no, that, let's, let's, really let's leave that in. It's funny. Um. No! <laughs> for one thing, it was Bard who actually said the name. So. <laughs> oh, fuck! Yeah. If you don't have an association between qualitative variables, then the occurrence of one or the non-occurrence of one doesn't tell you anything about the other. With quantitative variables, I'm going to draw some pictures here. Uh, so these are things that look like numbers. Oh, no. Yeah, so you might have a positive association that looks like that. A negative association would look like that. No association would typically look like this. Or... You might get something that looks like this. I love when the AI tries to write text or numbers and you just get... Oh, yes, but th- those aren't quantitative. Right. So by this, I mean something like um, so like the number of times that something has been used. Or right. if you're looking at astronomy data or something, the, the intensity of a particular wavelength of light. Mm. Right. So these are actual numbers, not just in an image, the presence or absence of a, of a feature. Right, that's gotcha. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So these are literally the data is a number, and this is an actual use case for a machine learning algorithm. They are better at identifying these kinds of weird, wiggly shapes than other more traditional statistical models that rely on an assumption of an underlying relationship. Mm-hmm. So if you are trying to fit to this wiggly data something that looks like a straight line, that's not going to fucking work. Yeah. But it is much harder to build a statistical model to give you the wiggly line than it is to give you to build a statistical model that gives you a straight one. So there are mathematical results about the kind of underlying sort of algorithms that go into this that say what sorts of relationships can be identified and how well they can be identified. And the answer is basically anything you like and pretty well up to the point of overfitting. And I want to talk about overfitting a little bit. That's what I do to my pants. That's what I do to my pants. That's a nice way of putting it, overfitting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you have some number of data points, I'm going to start with three. If you have um, a quadratic relationship, so if I have something that looks like uh, x squared plus x plus one, something that looks like that, there is only one of these that can fit to three data points perfectly. Yeah. There are infinitely many of them that can fit to two data points perfectly. Oh, wait. What does quadratic mean in this context? The highest power is two. Yeah. I'm just nodding along dumbly. I'm not following, but please. <laughs> okay, so the, the the point to see here is that there is a unique... <laughs> this is a bonus episode. Listener, you, you paid for this. You've done this to yourself. <laughs> so there is there is a unique result for three data points... Only one of these will perfectly go between between three data points. Yeah. So like x equals six. We'll say y is equal to. So here's x axis. Here's y axis. Uh, it would be a negative on there. So it would be something like this. Okay. What you're saying is there's only one sequence. Yeah. There's only one sequence of this, and usually you'll have like a x squared plus b x plus c, right? So yeah. there's. I know. I've just. I've just. Confused. So it does the uniqueness of that also mean that there is that those. X's will resolve to a unique... The, all those letters will resolve to a unique combination of values. Yeah, so that means a unique A, B, C. Right, not that there's a unique string of letters of algebraic values. No, so this is a very specific... This is a very specific form, so X... But that form could apply to multiple lines. Sorry, to multiple groups of points. Yeah, yeah, so every point on this line is a value of X such that that value of y is ax squared plus bx plus c. Right. So so if they resolved into different numbers, you'd have a slightly different line. Yeah. So okay. What I Sorry, got... I just had to... No, no, it's all good. To follow, because what you meant by unique, do you mean like... Yeah. yeah. I mean that the a, b, and c coefficients, as they are known, are unique to the fact that you have a data point here, a data point here, and a data point here. Gotcha. There is only one. Yeah. There are infinitely many for two data points. Right. And because we're talking about relationships between points 
which could also be relationships between data, you're saying that for an for something like an AI, we need to have these more exclusive relationships in order to get meaningful output? I'm going to expand on this for a second. Okay. So, for example, these are very bad parabolas, right? But you could have these two parabolas go perfectly through and anything you in between. want to know how I got these vectors? <laughs> these are parabolas, not vectors, dear. <sighs> yeah. Bart laughed. <laughs> the listener that's laugh. your listener, standards now listen up laugh <laughs> laugh listen oh that's so needy uh, very briefly in uh, university I did like open mic stand up comedy and if yeah. something didn't get a laugh I would go oh that's very funny what are you guys doing <laughs> so, <laughs> I feel like Dean is uh, doing the same thing here <laughs> Dean is always unintentionally channeling sad stand up comedy yeah, is that yeah. what you're saying <laughs> absolutely <laughs> nice oh, I'm glad to know that's the that's the that's the uh, <laughs> The respect I, I hold within your mind. Thank you. <laughs> the overfitting problem is specific to when you have data with error. So let's say that these are my data points. Right. And I'm trying to fit a quadratic model to them. So I want something that looks like this. So this is a reasonable quadratic model. But I don't have to stay with the form ax squared plus bx plus c. I could have... Uh, I'm going to write this as a1x to the 7. Actually, how many data points have I got? Let's make it to the 15. A, a plus a2x to the 14 plus... 17. Oh, 17. Okay, then we'll go for 18 to six, 17 to... I don't know if that was helpful. Either. That's all right. <laughs> Incredibly X pedantic. X plus <laughs> C, right? It would be reasonable to fit a quadratic model to this because you expect some amount of error, right? So the difference between points in the line. But... I could perfectly fit this 18 degree polynomial. So this is a degree 2 polynomial because the highest coefficient, the highest power is 2. Right. This is degree 18 polynomial. I'm sorry, what does polynomial mean? Lots of things that look like this. Okay, cool. Nothing to do with your tabletop group. <laughs> but you can perfectly fit a degree n polynomial to how many is it? Uh, n plus one data points. So what is what is the overfitting here? Is the problem well, if the underlying data? So this would be something like right. But what I'm getting is you've, you're saying it is a problem. Is the yes. problem the one that is too accurate or the one that is too loose? Well, if I then so let's say that this goes off like that, right? Yeah. So if I then put another data point in that I'm trying to predict because these are fundamentally predictive algorithms mm -hmm. and that data point is here. This is on the underlying relationship. Yeah. Even though the, if you will, overfitted model is more accurate to the data because it will have zero error to the observed data. Right. It's inaccurate to the um, new observation. I can kind of understand how this applies to AI. So if you make the model super strict, you're you're only ever going to get well, a very narrow band of output because... if you, Overfitting means basically that it fits too well to what you have observed because you are basically overtraining it on what you have observed. So right. it can't account for new stuff. So this is how you can see artists saying you've literally produced... The AI has just spat out my image with a different coloured background. It's literally identical. Yeah, so in, in that context, you could think of it more like there is insufficient other stuff. It hasn't been able to sufficiently like generalise what's going on. This is more about specifically quantitative relationships because what you are fitting here is a bad model for anything new. So right. describe to me what I'm trying to really put it in perspective to. Describe to me what you get out of this that is bad compared to what you want. Um, you have something that makes mistakes with unobserved things. But also, like, humans tend to have, like, five fingers unless they lose a few or whatever. Like, why does the AI produce images that can't account for how many fingers humans have? Ah, uh, because the AI is not able to identify what a finger is. Yeah, okay, right. That makes sense. Yeah, so we will get to this in a second when I talk about what it means when all you see is association. Yeah, right? right. But here, what I am talking about is specifically for quantitative variables, AIs are very, very good at fitting complex relationships. The problem is that sometimes you don't actually have a complex relationship, you just have error. Yeah, right. And, and for an AI, if it is not structured in a way that penalizes this kind of overfitting, it will give you something that has very little error on the data you train it with, 
but can't handle anything else. Yeah, right. So can't handle anything else. You're saying that if you give it a prompt that's outside sort of stuff, it's had tag. Or if you are training something to identify things in an image, right? Yeah. So let's say it identifies perfectly what you give it an image, and then you give it an image that is a slightly different angle to anything it's seen before, and it shits itself. Right. Okay, yes. Yeah. So this is, I guess, a question of seen and unseen data. If you are... So, so just to give an example, when you do like traffic lights on the Google Capture thing, yeah, it's always f- like facing the light or to the side. Are you saying that it's been so heavily trained on that it might fucking freak out if it saw one from behind because or like very steep angle below? Yeah, right. Because right. right. if you could imagine, like, I can't imagine that a steep angle from below a car would come in useful. So if you see this right from a very steep low angle. It would look like this, potentially more extreme. Yeah. Yeah. And it may not be able to identify that. Yeah. What you see versus what she sees. Dot. <laughs> <laughs> Jess just gave me the foulest fucking look. <laughs> but this is. But I now. But this really does help put in clarity for what the problem is here, because if you are an autonomous vehicle, this means that the moment you get into a situation you weren't explicitly trained for. You're going to go to pieces. Yeah, I mean... Because you can't handle... Yes, so what new information looks like is a big problem in AI. Yeah. Right. I am slightly misrepresenting overfitting here if I am just talking about quantitative stuff because these are not a quantitative yeah. mm-hmm. sort of system. But the, the underlying idea that if you have only been trained on one set of data and you're really, really good at training to that in the sense that you have no error on that... So in this case, this blue line touches every single data point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You will have literally zero error there. But the underlying relationship, which is the red line, it's very wrong about that. Yes. So it, it, the underlying relationship, what you're saying is that it it's able to recognize these 500,000 images you've given it, but it's not actually able to recognize a traffic light. Yes, because... And this is kind of the... You need human brain fuzziness to produce the happy red line, which just mellowly meanders among the among the. Well, the, the, the fundamental thing here is that the algorithm does not see meaning. The algorithm does not see content. This is why it's not actually intelligent. Yeah, yeah. All it sees are these associations, and these associations are fundamentally between things encoded in binary. Like, yeah. It doesn't see that there's a traffic light in this image. All it sees is that I'm able to identify some of these shapes based on a different scales of grid and they look like these other things that I have that have been tagged as traffic lights. Mm-hmm. It does not know what a traffic light yeah, is. Yeah. Sorry, listener, we're speaking to you from a designated break, but I decided to ask the question. Can you have an AI model that doesn't overfit or is it... If we come back up to here, you can say, I'm not going to let you have 18 fucking coefficients in this model. Right. You can say, at max, you get three so which will constrain you to this which and means you'll get more false positives but well you will have non-zero error right right but you won't have overfitting which means as you come across something that isn't accounted for you aren't you will still have some measure some error but yeah. you are not likely to have like something that's completely unexplainable for example if you look these end bits go down yeah the red line is not going down at the top i understand yeah okay that makes sense but of course, then you get to the problem where people want low error because they don't want their fucking mid-journey items to have 18 fingers. This is hard, right? And one of the things that makes this particularly difficult is that the way that I have expressed this here is difficult to get out of an AI algorithm. You can't just open the box up and say, oh, there it is. You have to do a lot of A-B testing to actually identify where associations are, particularly in things like mid-journey or whatever. Yeah. And it's just, we have built these things with the intention that they are able to process large amounts of data to identify associations that we struggle to see. Yes. The problem is that they are now difficult to extract those associations from. Yeah, I know that there are things that are hard for humans to form associations on, but we also seem to be using it to look at large amounts of data to find associations that humans are very good at finding. Like, draw me a human face. It's like, they always fuck it up slightly because human beings, it turns out, are really good at spotting human faces and noting where they're fucky. Well, this is a misapplied use, basically. Well, it's also like that shit of, like, the ways I've seen, like, people use the visual AI stuff is doing, like, anime stuff or Wes Anderson stuff, where it has a very distinctive visual style, but that distinctive visual style had to be come up with in a particular way you know like, yeah, it's not yeah. um so, so an ai may be able to identify an artist or an artist's style 
but that does not mean that they can recreate it accurately because they don't actually know what the artist is drawing because they can't actually see the yeah. meaning. Yeah. Which does raise the question, who is putting up that much? <laughs> For example, one of my favorite things I ever typed into um, an AI generator was cannibal grimace trail cam footage. And it looked fantastic. <laughs> now, I don't question where we have that much trail cam footage because, you know, oh, the, YouTube. the internet. Yeah, absolutely. But how many people are drawing Cannibal Grimace? You will have a lot of trail cam footage. You'll have a lot of trail cam footage of shapes that are kind of Grimace-like, bears and things. You'll have a bunch of identified things that look like Grimace. And you will have a bunch of material, which is where Cannibal aesthetic comes from. Mm. These things, I mean, one of the kind of creativity parts of building prompts that I think is undeniably creative is picking out different things that might look interesting because there is some sort of fundamental juxtaposition between them yeah, yeah. to mash together. The Muppets storm the beach at Normandy. I would like to see that. Honestly, like Muppets saving Private Ryan, Ryan fucking great movie. But um, <laughs> I do think that it's kind of interesting that like one of the things that they do is just like expand on the background of like famous paintings. And it's like, yes, the artist there picked the particular framing they were going for. They didn't just exclude it because, like, they didn't know what they were doing or whatever. Well, like, Yes, again, AI does not see yeah. meaning. And and this is a thing where there is, as far as, like, I, I don't think we will ever actually go to the point where an AI can understand meaning, and it's one of the things I don't think AI is a very good term because they're not actually intelligent. Yeah. I mean, we could, we could dunk on things like, finally, we could find out who Godot is. <laughs> what Godot looked like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We could tackle that all day, but that's human folly, not... I don't actually blame that on the machine. That's Well, no, I mean, it's something that we should not expect the machine to be able to do because it's not creative or intelligent. Yeah. That's... But the next problem with this sort of association-based thing is that you can have spurious associations. My favourite kind. So one of my favourite websites is, Spur is about spurious correlations, and it looks at things like, does orange production in the US correlate with something else, right? Mm. So it's basically, do these things tend to increase or decrease together in time and like you could find some very strong but extremely spurious correlations like for example the amount of radioactive material in use in the u.s and reactors and the number of uh mathematics phds which tells you that radioactivity causes mathematicians clearly well that, i believe that well yeah. also like vaccines and <laughs> autism <laughs> yeah I, I will i mean so many of these things are basically a matter of looking at things that have increased over time and the reason for those increases are not actual relationships between the underlying things. Yeah. But because all machine learning sees is the associations, machine learning does not see meaning, it has no capacity to determine if there is an actually believable relationship there or not. Have you seen um, AI try to produce travel luggage? No. It's something about travel luggage in all of its various different forms, which all gets lumped under the same category. Right. Means you get these impossible combinations of like handles and clasps and zippers and weird <laughs> shapes. Yeah. Because it all falls under the same like luggage, but it's so diverse it can't. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the association is spurious. It doesn't actually understand this is something that would contain items. Yes. This was something that would serve a function. So there are a couple of ways that this can happen. You can have what's called a false positive, which means that something occurs when it shouldn't. False negative. Something doesn't occur when it should. Or the wrong shape of a relationship. Yeah. And look, these are things that come up in science. These are things that come up in everyday life. But in those areas, you have some human looking at it and going, hang on, that's funny, I don't believe it. Whereas with an AI, not only is, there, is it very difficult to get that kind of oversight because, you know, they are difficult to unpack, but actually excluding those associations is really fucking hard. If you need to dig into an algorithm's setup and do a whole bunch of kind of A-B testing to work out, okay, this is the actual thing that is associated with this other thing. For example, um, if you have an algorithm that's trained to identify bullet casings, but it's the data that it's trained on is crime scene photos, so they've all got little rulers in them. <laughs> <laughs> what it will learn to identify is the presence of the, the ruler, ruler. Yeah, not yeah. the bullet casing. These things can occur, and working out what's going on is hard. It's not necessarily impossible, but the way that we structure these things and the way that we pour more and more data into them every day makes it harder and harder as we go on. So I like to think of, in science, we apply what we might call a sniff test, also known as a bullshit test, which is, do I believe what they're saying? And this is not an absolute test. It's just that if you don't believe what they're saying, 
they're going to have to have some really fucking good evidence to convince you. This is, of course, prone to biases, as are all such things, but I think that the inability to apply such a sniff test to the relationships built into these algorithms makes them a problem. Yeah, and by de- I mean by design, they're sort of obfuscated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then informed that because the machine doesn't necessarily produce code that is human readable. Well, yeah, the underlying relationships are not identifiable. Like, the structure is too complex. I've said that I don't think that the artificial intelligence is intelligent. I also don't think that machine learning is actually learning. Because what gets referred to as machine learning is that you don't tell the machine where the associations are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It identifies them, which isn't actually learning, because as a teacher, shall we say, learning means you understand the content of something and the meaning of something, not that you see that two things co-occur. I can like uh, sympathize with the AI people in small regard, in that like intelligence is not necessarily like a fixed Yeah, notion. yeah, we don't have a good definition of it. And like animal intelligence, for example, is not like very well understood and like... I am willing to accept that sometime in the future there may be some sort of algorithm that can identify things in a manner that we would call intelligent. Yeah. We don't have that yet. No, certainly. And that would still not be a human intelligence, it would be something else. No, absolutely. The fundamental problem is that this is getting sold to people on the street like it is that. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. it's just not. Because Dean has asked that we hurry on, I want to talk a bit about the underlying data and where it comes from. So we have the data itself, what we might call the raw data. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> which is your text, your images, your audio, your video, these sorts of things. All of which get represented as some sort of binary in a computer. You then have metadata. No, I don't. I use a private browser. <laughs> so this is contextual information. So you might have an image of, let's say, your traffic lights in your street, and then you have tags associated with that image identifying that this thing contains a street, some trees, a car, and some traffic lights. That metadata is not part of the image itself, but it is used for the associations of that data with other things that have those tags. Yeah. Data and metadata are not the same, um, but metadata is really, really critical, particularly for things that are not text-based. Yeah. If you do have something that's text-based, it'll probably be like, this is the language that this comes from. If it's a little bit more complex, it might identify the parts of speech that different words are, so it'll pick out your nouns, your verbs, that sort of thing. Now I want to talk about where does this come from? Overwhelmingly, raw data is scraped from the internet. There are some... ethically, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> there are That's some right. specific cases where, like, it's been intentionally gathered for the purpose of this, like astronomy, for example. If you are looking at medical data where it's like, I have diagnosis of cell cultures as it containing cancer or not, then somebody has actually been paid to produce that. But on the whole, the raw data is from unpaid labor. And this is true of particularly things like ChatGBT and Midjourney and whatever that are based on scrapes of the internet. The people who produce the raw data are typically unpaid for their labor, they don't get access to or control over how that is used, and there are huge ethical problems around things like rights of creators. When it comes to the metadata, so in this context things... Sometimes you have like paid situations. So like if a medical person is diagnosing things in an image culture, then they have been paid to do it as well as people paying to take the images. But in cases like the raw, like the metadata for astronomy information, you can have large groups of volunteers. Typically a small handful of them will do most of the work. But citizen scientists, that's not a derogatory term. There are people who literally spend a lot of their time doing this sort of stuff for free. Yeah. I think that there are problems with that model for doing work. That's because we live in an economy and we live under capitalism, right? I, I've never had an office job. At yeah. the same time, like I'm assuming if you work an office job, just like looking now out for some uh for some things looking out for some galaxies yeah yeah yeah. that that seems like a fun thing to do i'm not like uh if somebody chooses to use their time from it that's up to them Yeah, yeah then you have all of the data sets that are particularly metadata tagged by people who live in really shit conditions as in fundamentally exploitative jobs. Oh, I'm sorry. So these, oh, this the is mechanical Turks of the, the world. mechanical Turks of the yeah. world. So this can be people. I am not joking about this. In refugee camps in places like in North Africa and South America and things, where they have basically been handed a computer, stuck in a tent, and basically told you are doing this for the next t- twelve hours or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They get paid basically nothing. They are even told that this is training them for work 
which is so fucking insulting. <laughs> you also have other situations where you have like Facebook and these things training moderation algorithms by basically throwing the worst content you can possibly imagine at extremely underpaid people in server in what we might call moderation farms in the Philippines and things like that. So these are people who are exposed to a lot of extremely violent uh, violent sexual material, just straight up violence and child sexual abuse material. Yeah. And they are not paid well. They are not given sufficient protection from the psychological damage and hazards that this comes with. Mm. They are not given adequate support for doing that work. And this is just an abuse of people who do not have adequate workplace protections. I would argue from this that these are not just not intelligent. These are not really artificial either. These are systems built off of human intelligence, off of human reasoning and identification, and they are just regurgitating that for new data. Again, ultimately, my trite comment that these things are just new forms of existing class relations yeah. is applicable here. We Capital has to keep squeezing... And the, it's desperate to find a new way to squeeze. Yeah, there's only yeah. so much left in the fucking lemon, and this is just one new kind of big vice that you, lets you break... The same populations it's always abused yeah. in a new and different way. It's kind of interesting in this case because it's like you always wanted a group of like white collar workers who would kind of like love the system in a way. Uh, not <laughs> love the system. They might hate it. You would have a group of white collar workers who were kind of like dependent on We're bought on in. The, we're bought in. Yeah, exactly. And then now they're like, ah, oh, I don't think we need these people. <laughs> And that seems yeah. like a bad yeah. move, honestly. <laughs> well, one thing I want to say before we talk about like the wh why the worst cunts you know love this and why that they they are mistaken is that there's a genuinely sad but also bleakly funny aspect of this, which is that because chatbots and these sorts of things have been unleashed on the internet and, and generative algorithms in particular have been unleashed on the internet to produce website content without anybody really saying now hang on a second should we do this there is now no data set of the internet that is really clean of generated data yeah, yeah it's it's shitting into its own mouth well so i actually have a list here of possible titles for this section that i won't write because we're already out of time <laughs> so the first is mad cow for your computer <laughs> the second is computer centipede and the third is the machine Ouroboros. Yeah, and, and Google is just becoming unusable. Yes. You go to look up, it used to be even five years ago, like a game like Baldur's Gate 3 comes out, you can find a wiki or a resource which can tell you, answer questions you have that are stuff that's not presented in the game. Like, quick example, in the game it doesn't tell you how rogue sneak attack damage scales. Now, if you want to find that, the first 30 results are all AI written articles that start... Baldur's Gate 3 is a new game from Larian Studios. Rogues are a powerful class. You have to scroll down 10 paragraphs to find information that I must stress is often fucking wrong. Yeah. See, my, my favorite thing about the current internet is that the internet archive can no longer like lend people shit because like oh my god it's so bad <laughs> that was like the last holdout of like a good thing on the internet <laughs> yeah. and it's just like Gone. Yeah, yeah. So I do Fucking want rules. to give one example of an actually good use of a large language model. This is a large language model explicitly for Te Reo Māori, which is the language of Māori people in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And a organization over there, a Māori media organization called Tehiku Media, basically said, we don't have ways to do closed captions, for example, or transcribe Māori radio shows that we are presenting, and we need something to do this. So they have built a large language model that is used as a translation resource for Te Reo. It is built and owned and operated by and for the benefit of Māori people. So it is not held under a traditional kind of copyright system. Yeah. It's held under what we might call kaitia kitanga, which is basically a sort of stewardship ownership where or it is kind of owned by the collective and is intended to benefit the collective. And in particular, you can't sell this. Yeah. This was done because, uh, what is it, Duolingo, for example, and other sorts of big tech companies were proposing that they could translate and give, give language resources for Māori, Te Reo Māori, and they can't, and the resources were wrong, and in particular, the benefits of those were not flowing to the Māori community. So this is a good use case because it has been built with the aim of capturing and treasuring and enhancing Te Reo Māori language resources. 
It is owned by the people whose language is being preserved. It is being controlled by them, and people using it are asked to give back to that community if they benefit. And it's from not it. displacing, or I assume it is not displacing existing labour. No. no um, yeah. So in particular, there are not enough Maori speakers to do this, and this is being used as a tool to increase the number of Maori speakers. In, wow. It, it is also <laughs> not being used in a manner that is considered to be authoritative. So if it's somebody who is like a native speaker of Māori says, well, actually, from my part of the country, our, our pronunciation of this is different, that is authoritative. Yeah. yeah. The algorithm saying otherwise is considered wrong. It goes to what, what we've been saying this entire episode, which is that the technology, I think, is, isn't inherently bad. It's just everything surrounding it. It turns out if you take all of those factors and make them just... Wow, the technology is great. It's performing a, a positive role in the community. Yeah. And critically, I don't think you could do that with like Aboriginal languages in Australia. No, so there are there are a bunch of Indigenous groups that have looked at things like this particular model and looked at things like language nest models to yeah. in New Zealand. I must go. Okay, and are adopting them. Yeah, it, it is harder because there is less content available for indigenous languages here because the populations for each individual one are typically smaller. Yeah, yeah. This does not mean it's unusable. It just means that it's going to be an awful lot more work to get it off the ground. Yeah, yeah. And it's also like the language differences in the Australian context are not just uh, sort of dialect or pronouncing kind of things. They are no, like you have l- entirely, entirely different, different language languages. families yeah, yeah. here. Yeah. So there are probably a couple of languages that would have enough stuff in language to be candidates for this. Yeah. But again that would be a lot of work yeah and um it's not so common over here because you just don't have a population base or the resources to do it thanks colonialism yeah yeah. to have a 30 year old radio station that has that much material yeah of course in under my grimmer stuff section uh is that ai won't take your job but we'll make it worse so this is why the worst people you know are super excited about this, right? Because it is intended to be able to supplant labor. It is tended to, intended to be able to further de-skill a workforce, particularly highly skilled, highly paid white collar people who do, if you quote unquote, knowledge work. Yeah. The idea is that the magic box of an ally can in fact just replace all your workers and it doesn't fucking work. Yeah. Translators were the first people subjected to this. Google Translate is not a great tool to actually do translations. It's okay if you have a sign or something you need to read, yeah, yeah. but it's not able to translate a text on the whole. It can't do discourse. But translators were kind of the first people who got fired for this. Now they are getting rehired under worse working conditions and lower pay yeah. to basically fix all the fucking problems that come out of using AI to do this or, mach- or large language models. Anyone in that industry will tell you that like the AI, well not the AI, but like the Google Translate version of the document is completely useless and you have to like retranslate yeah, it. You like- basically have to do your entire job again, yeah, 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 but absolutely. you just get paid less to do it. So now this is coming for actors, writers and artists. So you see this in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Also, like, customer service people and community services. Therapists like Eliza are a kind of early example of where the people are salivating over... Well, cunts, I should say, are salivating <laughs> over using this. It's not going to fucking work because they don't understand meaning and they have no empathy. Because an algorithm cannot have empathy. Although I will say that the current system of therapy and psychiatry is not great either. No, th- look, there are better and worse systems, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> I'm also going to write teaching here, not because I think that AIs can teach, they can't, but because I think that there are people who believe that AIs can teach enough that they will be willing to use these large language models in other machine learning systems in schools for poor people because they don't actually care. In this point of history, like everyone's trying to like fuck up public education as like a concept. Whatever direction you can get from it, you go to like the most extreme one of those. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So so this will absolutely be used in charter schools in the US, for example, where somebody will roll it won't be, you know, you roll the TV in to watch the video of the exciting science man. It will be everybody gets handed their tablet to talk to the algorithm that has no concept of truth because they don't understand meaning and will just walk people through the most rudimentary bullshit generated by AI, yeah. quote unquote taught by AI, and nobody will fucking learn anything as a result Absolutely. of this. It's extremely grim. We should be fighting that with every tool at our disposal. And also like, I don't know, I went to like posh private school for a while for the last four years of my education. There's as much bad teachers as there are in any other fucking school. If you look at the really posh private schools in particular, 
they are banning this stuff. They are refusing to use it because they know it's No, of course. Shit. They they know it's up. It's just that they're also just like fucking substandard education like every other school. <laughs> Much better resourced substandard teacher. Absolutely, yeah. So that is everything I have. Dean has already run away, but thank you so much. Thank you as ever. And if you are listening to this, you are already a Patreon subscriber. Thank you for your money. Uh, We look forward to doing more of these in the future. Yeah, I'm excited. See you later.